Good morning everyone and a warm welcome to the Nordic Africa Institute. My name is Therese Schumander Magnusson and I'm the director of NAI. Welcome to this seminar, this very timely seminar titled The War in Ukraine, Impacts on and Responses from Africa. Russia's invasion of the Ukraine confronts us with the new reality of geopolitical transformation. It also challenges the member states of the United Nations on how to position themselves when former alliances are being evaluated and redefined. Divergence and divide seems to be characterizing much of the tone in international relations at this point in time. Not only are the different responses by African governments to the war in Ukraine in focus, by, but meanwhile, the war and the unfolding geopolitical crisis have serious implications for many African countries. After two years of economic stress as a direct consequence of the COVID pandemic, People in Africa are now also burdened by the increased food and energy prices and the general increased cost of living. With the conflict ongoing, if not further escalating, assessing its impacts on African countries and their responses remains a continued task. In response to the dynamics unfolding, the journal Strategic Review for Southern Africa by the Department of Political Science at the University of Pretoria published a special issue on the subject with a variety of aspects and perspectives covered. Two of the <coughs> members of the editorial collective are Patience Mosusa and Henning Melber. Kwesi Aning and Asem Hatab were contributors to the issue with Adbayo Olokushu as a close observer. And I'm very pleased that all of them are joining us here today as panelists and discussants. The aim of today's seminar is to shed more light on the geopolitical consequences of the war in Ukraine through four analytical entry points. First, on Russia's military role in Africa. Second, on the impacts on food security. Thirdly, on African voting behavior in the UN. And fourthly, the impacts on the political governance of Africa. The intention is that we, together with the reflections put forward by today's discussant, Patience Mosusa, that we have an in-depth conversation about the impacts and responses from Africa. And I expect that the audience engage and reflect together with the panelists. And I will therefore invite all of you to raise questions and comments after the presentations. With that brief introduction, I will now turn to our panelists, whom I will invite one by one and introduce to do their Ignite Talks. You have 15 minutes each. So first, let me welcome Professor Kwesia Ning, who will speak about Russia's military role in Africa. Professor Kwesia Ning, please join me, is the director of the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, Ghana, and clinical, clinical professor of peacekeeping practice at Kenso State University in Atlanta. He holds the current Claude Acker Visiting Chair, a collaboration between the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University and the Nordic Africa Institute. Professor, the floor is yours. Therese, thank you very much. And let me thank my co-panelists and, of course, the discussant and those in the room. My topic is Russia's military role in Africa. I mean, there's no doubt at all that the last 12 months has raised multiple questions about Russia's role broadly on the continent, not least the role of its military 
engagement. But how should we understand the confluence of the factors paving the way for Russian influence building on the continent since the first Russia-Africa summit in 2019? I think if not because of the war, the next summit was scheduled for this year. And I think since that time, we are seeing a manifest increase in Russia's hybrid presence on the continent. And I'll explain why I'm using this word hybrid specifically. How important is Russia's role on the continent? And I think we need to go back probably a decade and a half, two decades. Mr. Putin showed very little interest in Africa in the 2000s. He was more interested in juggling power in Moscow. But his invasion of Crimea and Western sanctions and his suspension from the G8 in 2014 motivated him and Moscow to seek new geopolitical friends and business opportunities. But not just new friends, but also reopen old friendships that had waned since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And since 2019, there has been an aggressive move by Mr. Putin and his friends to demonstrate their presence, at least in about 13 countries across the continent, building relationships with existing friends. And uh, not too many of them are the most pleasant characters on the continent. Striking new military deals, and what I would want to focus on a little bit later, grooming a new generation of undemocratic leaders and infiltrating the, co the continent with undercover agents. My argument is very simple, that when Russia comes doing business, whether it is of the military type, whether it is through the use of you know, proxy state power, the Wagner Group, or whether it's about mining, as we are seeing in uh, the Republic of Guinea, we are seeing a confluence of a new expression of power from Moscow through both military and economic strategies. <clears throat> Moscow sees its military presence in Africa in very, in very broad terms, building on ties from the Soviet times. Putin, I would argue, perceives Africa now as one of Russia's key foreign policy priorities and has spoken about five things. First, offering political and diplomatic support to the continent, and we can see this in different international fora, defense and security support, which I'll spend a bit more time on, economic assistance, disease control advice, humanitarian relief assistance, and educational and vocational training. But how do we put all this in a broader picture? And how come we all overlooked this quiet infiltration, or let me put it this way, re-infiltration of the continent? And I think it reflects the mistaken assumptions by risk assessors and insecurity strategies up here in the West. And Mr. Putin is an old friend. We can deal with him. We need this oil and gas. At the same time, he was gradually coming into the continent, building support and selling uh, uh, weapons. So what we are seeing is that Russia has been boosting its diplomatic links in the region with various heads of states, visiting Moscow since 2015. And I think if one looks at the list of, of African leaders who have visited, probably we are looking about around 25 to 30 heads of states. 
you know, six visiting alone in 2019. Its ambitions have prompted several concerns, and there's no doubt at all that Mr. Putin is, uh, is uh, 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 outplaying quite a number of, of, of observers. But particularly since 2019, Russia has aggressively been seeking deals and security relationships, focusing on three partners. One, undermining the French presence, which it has succeeded in doing in, in, in uh, Mali, Burkina Faso. No doubt at all that the French will lose in, central, um, in Chad and also in Niger. This aggressive seeking of deals and security relationships is also undercutting the U.S. influence and seeks to outplay um, the European Union. Militarily, since 2015, Russia has concluded several military, military cooperation ag agreements, at least with 21 Af African countries. Prior to this, and this is where it becomes interesting, Russia had only four military cooperation treaties across the continent. Okay, so there's an aggressive attempt at drawing up these agreements, and there's also a receptivity from the African side. In my concluding remarks, I will point to fairly disturbing signs about what this means. And I don't have any doubt at all that a debayos conversation around the governance implications will buttress that point. So Russia has become an important defense partner for the continent and a major supplier of arms to the, to the region. Although Africa is not its biggest defense market, the, biggest defense market is in Asia. But between 2014 and 2020, excluding e Egypt, Russia accounted for 16% of, of its exports, or military exports, to, to, to the continent. And of those, 80% went to Algeria. So in terms of the volume, they are fairly small, but they are enough for authoritarian, autocratic regimes to repress their, their citizens. And therein lies the danger that we need to talk about. In 2020, Russia exported 1.5 billion worth of military hardware to 10 countries. In 2021 alone, it exported $1.7 billion worth of arms to La Côte d'Ivoire alone. So you begin to see the possible constellation of violent extremists coming down south. And although the concern right now is about leakages of weapons being sent to Ukraine, were the government in La Côte d'Ivoire to fall, you can imagine the amount of weapons that will come into the hands of people. So Russia's presence is not just about shoring up authoritarian regimes, but it is providing enough arsenals to keep the, the continent unstable for as long as possible. But South Africa has also signed a nuclear technology deal with, South, with the Russian that is extremely disturbing in its terms. One that the South Africans cannot export what comes out of that deal and they cannot share the knowledge that comes from that deal. So which are the major importers of uh, Russian military hardware? Angola, Nigeria, Sudan, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Equatorial Guinea. These include jet fighters, combat and transport helicopters, anti-tank missiles, and engines for fighter planes. Earlier on, I spoke about hybridity. Russia's role in terms of ex 
exporting its military hardware is closely linked now with the usage of its Wagner mercenary group. And let's get this straight. The Wagner group is not just a mercenary group. It's also a business. It's a risk assessment business that simply does not go into a place without asking tough questions, A, about the receptivity to its type of governance, about receptivity to its type of military engagement, but more importantly, where natural resources are located that they can exploit. The Wagner Group, I will, I will argue, is serving a useful purpose for the Russian state. And I think we need to understand this hybridity. And I want to go back a couple of years. In 2018, the Wagner Group developed, developed a map of the continent showing the levels of cooperation between the Wagner Group on one hand, the Russian state, and different African states. In a country by country assessment, the symbols on that map indicate the military, political, and economic ties, police training, media, and humanitarian uh, projects, particularly with rivalry towards France. Five is the highest level, and one is the, is the lowest. The closest relations are with Central African Republic, Sudan, and Madagascar, all put at five. Zimbabwe and South Africa are listed as four, and according to the map, South Sudan at, th at three, Chad and Zimbabwe at two. But herein lies the main point. The document also cites Uganda, Equatorial Guinea, and Mali, quote, as countries where we plan to work. We know that Equatorial Guinea is unstable. The president has just decided to go for another round of election, and I can assure you, the Wagner Group is watching. Mali has experienced two coup d'etats. Burkina Faso has followed. Two, three days ago, there was an attempted coup in Sawatomi and Principe. Let me make this very point very clear. Two more coup d'etats in West Africa, then the pack of cards that we call democratic states will begin to fall apart. The Wagner Group, has also flagged uh, Libya and Ethiopia and other West African states, quote, as nations where cooperation is possible. Okay, so the dynamics of what is happening in terms of the military support goes way beyond the presence of the Wagner Group itself. It is dealing with states, is dealing with companies, but the signal that Russia's military presence is sending to people in West Africa and the Sahel and other African states, is that you can take state power, the West can scream and shout, we will back you. All you need is to get us into town and we will provide the regime security that you are, you are desperate for. In the last two minutes that I have got, I, I want to make this point that when I talk about hybrid Russian influence and the military, that the economic side is also very key. That the economic side creates an opening for the military to get in. We are seeing that state-owned Russian companies have been mining bauxite in uh, Guinea. They are cutting deals to extract, extract diamonds from Angola and they are winning concessions to produce offshore gas in, in Mozambique. Russia and its military expression laughs places of instability. But not only that, the Russian private energy giant Luk Oil is also in Cameroon, in my own country, Ghana. And then in uh, Bayos country, Nigeria, and has just acquired a stake 
in the Republic of Congo. So let me conclude by saying this. From all Moscow's military engagements on the continent, there's no doubt at all that its capacity to support the development of institutional solutions in the country where in the countries where it is presently operating is very limited, if not non-existent. Moscow is not in a position to provide options that are required to transform the political deadlocks in these countries, to provide economic hope, and to transform the deep insecurities in most of the countries where it is operating. All that we can say for now is that amidst the current geopolitical uh, paradigm, there is a renewed great power uh, uh, rivalry, a great power rivalry that seeks to drive out the US, France, and the e e e e e EU. Those who would lose in terms of their struggles for rule of law, for respect for, uh, de uh, for hum human rights and deepening democracy are the ordinary citizens of the continent. Thank you.